Welcome to Slash Forward. In this movie recap, we're going to pay deference to a modern cinematic masterpiece. In the 2011 home invasion film, You're Next, we'll follow Aaron and Crispin, a young couple on their way to a celebration of life and love, with Crispin's wealthy and only mildly dysfunctional family. The celebratory mood is muted somewhat when a trio of mask-wearing buttholes begin terrorizing the group and picking them off one by one. Sometimes, under extreme duress, people exhibit qualities they didn't even know know we're in there, and Aaron discovers that she's pretty good at killing folks. But as their numbers begin to dwindle and the lines of loyalty begin to blur, will she be able to unlock the skills necessary to survive this ordeal? And will she bring anyone along with her if so? Let's watch and find out that, as well as whether this movie would be your style of cup of tea. I'd love for you to leave a comment about your favorite scene from this movie and to check out some of the other home invasion films on the channel. Let's get to it. We open on some lackadaisical lovemaking, where the aged professor finds himself outclassed by his young concubine. Afterward, she gets partially dressed and goes to put on some music, but pauses momentarily at the foreboding light of the motion detectors. Satisfied of their seclusion, she puts on a compact disc, which is like a large, flat MP3 that exists in the real world, and pours a refreshing glass of OJ as the lights flip back on. The professor gets done washing the stank off him and emerges to a message indicating his place in line, which could be a good thing depending on the circumstances. In this case, it's accompanied by a dead body and a machete man, so leaning toward bad. We then travel along with Paul and Aubrey, making their way out to their quaint little vacation residence. Paul discovers the door to be unlocked, but presumes it to be the careless disregard of the workmen. Those filthy layabouts. In case we couldn't tell. So your parents are pretty loaded, right? Aaron and Crispin exposit on the subject of his family's wealth. This only multiplies the anticipation of their visit, because what if it turns out that they're giving out treats? As they make some basic preparations, Obbs hears a thump upstairs that couldn't have been Paul based on timing alone. She insists they rush out quick as a fiddle, but you boys got some personal stuff to work out. He he goes upstairs and does a cursory glance about, and even though he heard a clear noise, Crispin's arrival leads him away. So when they get outside, this is all chalked up to wacky old mom back on her meds again. That evening, Aaron comments on how normal Crispin's parents are, and how lucky he seems to be to have such a warm family. However, he warns her of what's to come when the rest of the brood infests the house. We also see Aubrey get some nighttime water, and the voyeurs among us are lucky enough to be treated to a first-person window gaze. Crispin awakes the next morning to the commotion of a full house. He comes downstairs for a little brotherly game of grab-ass with Drake, and discovers that Aaron has already been filled in on all of his most embarrassing childhood stories. Aaron tries to find a chance to endear herself by helping out in the kitchen, but Aubrey likes things just so. Instead, she's sent on a fool's errand to fetch a cup of milk. She says hello to the wood boys as they admire a fine grain, and then ventures into the unfamiliar wilderness. Crispin tries to get in good with his pops here by complimenting his sick plank, but the conversation turns professional, requiring Crispin to admit he didn't get his fellowship, much to daddy's chagrin. We also learn that Drake and Kelly like to primp and preen, and also that they have casual access to prescription drugs. Meanwhile, Aaron arrives at the neighbor's house, and it's revealed that this property belongs to that scummy guy from the opening. The night marks the arrival of Amy, the precious one, with her boyfriend Tariq and her brother Felix with his girlfriend Z. After they all meet and compare neckerchiefs, Aubrey hits them with a touching official notice of gratitude regarding their presence. After thanking the big man for allowing their cup to runneth over so well, they tuck into a designer dinner worthy of a pottery barn catalog. They're enjoying some banal conversation that is ruined by Crispin appearing content. Drake puts an end to that by calling attention to he and Aaron's former teacher-student relationship. It's a little with commentary. What results is a classic and intrafamilial communication. But off somewhere, in the distance, a most curious sight is beheld by Tariq that, unfortunately, threatens to put a damper on their evening. The space erupts into chaos as bolts come crashing through the window. With one winging Drake, Aaron attempts to regain composure and focus them on safety. But their phones aren't working. Yeah, they must be using a jammer. You can get them on the internet for like 30 bucks. Hey, thanks, bro. In the alternative, she helps them organize, acquire cover, and exit the dining room with no further injury. In the foyer, Aaron helps them fight the urge to remove the foreign object ravaging Drake's body, instead having them apply pressure and narcotics as they attempt to regroup. 
but in discussing the matter of running, they nearly kill each other over disputes about who is fastest. The topic causes young Amy to wither from a lack of positive reinforcement. Determined to take up this cross as her own, she asserts her superiority, winds herself up, and takes off for the door like a bullet. <laughs> much to her detriment, as the effort opens a hole that cannot be closed. While the family is sent to a state of abject despair, Erin retreats up the stairs to ensure the premises are secure. She also sets her phone to dial 911, hoping that if there's even a moment of reception, it'll text through an alert message. When Erin returns, she recommends a strategy of turtling and complete lockdown, while Aubrey is escorted upstairs to sleep off her grief. But no sooner is she left to wallow in her own misery than does an unknown figure begin to slow emerge from beneath the bed. Her scream puts a pause on the plan, drawing the family upstairs and leaving Aaron alone to be accosted. However, she does manage to pin the tiger's paw to the windowsill, at least temporarily. Upstairs, they learn the nightmare has just begun and that at least one sick freak is inside the house. This is objectively confirmed when Kelly lingers to tend to the matriarch and discovers that the wolf is still among them. This sets her to running and Drake is held back when he twangs his bolt and then faints in frustration, leaving her to fend for herself. Assuming she was successful, Crispin volunteers to also run out and bring one of the cars around to the door. At the neighbor's house, Kelly gets very cross with the strange man who refuses to let her in, but she is helped through the door. When she crawls around, she finds herself feeling fairly silly about this whole affair, and then her adventure is brought to a conclusion when the lamb tees off on her face with an axe, before taking a well-deserved breather. Back at the house, Crispin has returned to inform them that the vehicles have been disabled. But he didn't see anyone out there, so his next big idea is to abandon them, run a safe distance out, and see if he can use his phone to get help. He promises his love that he shall return, and then runs like the wind. With a bit of downtime, they consider the fact that they're not alone inside and move Drake to a safer location. Erin then goes to check on her pasta and grab a selection of weapons. After she returns to the others, an intruder crashes through the window and she finds herself at the mercy of Daniel Tiger after a long life that has treated him poorly. However, she takes no mercy on his balls and leverages the element of surprise to go absolutely apeshit with a tenderizer to his dome. After confirming that no one recognizes the stupid jerk, they see that Kelly was the object he used to smash through the window. In the commotion, they lost track of Paul, who has gone off alone to hunt the man what killed his wife. He finds a little makeshift hovel in an upstairs closet, complete with a bottle of piss. Just then, the power goes out and Felix sends Aaron to the breaker box in the basement while he goes to find his dad. They do find him, and as he reveals his new learnings, the wolfman comes out to slice his neck open. This kind of grosses Felix out a little bit. In the aftermath, we begin to wonder if maybe he has some small hand in this. While Aaron's still poking around in the basement, the lamb comes in and loudly laments the loss of his jungle friend, which he just feels so deeply. This gives away his position, so Aaron tries to gain a tactical advantage. He's really starting to get down on himself when Aaron accidentally bumps the door. Desiring to ascertain his status results in that classic eye thing. His subsequent ingress is delayed when Drake just waltzes out in a daze, allowing Aaron to give their assailant a little poke that prompts him to scurry off. When they all reunite, Felix gives the all clear on the upstairs and claims that Papa is having a rest. Down in the basement, Aaron grabs some wood and nails and leaves the boys to fiddle with their tools. Upstairs, the ladies begin trap crafting and Z starts a conversation in which it is revealed that Aaron spent her childhood on a survivalist compound with her wacko dad. And so she missed out on Tamagotchis, but she did learn some vital skills. Downstairs, Felix shares the unfortunate news about Kelly. Kelly's dead, you didn't know that? And to punctuate that, he goes to clean up their workspace by utilizing Drake as a pegboard, inserting various implements into him with an apologetic tone. Back upstairs, Z considers cracking Aaron with a board, but thinks better of it. Instead, when Aaron goes to check on Paul, Z undermines her efforts by doing a totally half-assed job on the final plank, before creating an easy access point for the intruders. When Aaron finds Paul asleep, but not in bed, she begins to develop some suspicions. She's forced to set those aside and dip out the window for her own safety. She hits the ground hard and then runs off into the woods as the window pane makes sweet love to her thigh. As she slowly slides its rough edges along her soft tissues, her environmental observations reveal that she has stumbled into the lamb's den. She runs back into the house to find a safe spot to stem the blood flow. In the meantime, the lamb arrives at the window and easily spots their little trap, giving him the confidence to perch on the sill with his little tactical boots and just take a quick hop down. Where he discovers his boots are only puncture resistant, not puncture proof. 
His moans of agony prompt Felix to send Wolfman to check on it. Once they're alone, Z tries to see if she can get something going next to dead mommy. Unfortunately, her boo is a boring little bitch boy. They reconvene downstairs where any questions of culpability are laid to rest. I just had to kill my own brother because you guys keep getting beat up by some girl. And Felix learns that Lamb and Tiger were biological brothers. Through some accident of nature, due to the raised stakes, Felix agrees to increase their pay scales and reassures them that he'll get them as soon as his allowance comes through. Then, at the worst possible moment, an alert confirms that the SOS was received. Wolf creeps up, but is ill-prepared for Kung Fu. She runs out and circles back, leaving the gang to chase nothing. Of course, there's no pulling the wool over his eyes, and he demonstrates his superior tracking skills by finding her. With a little bit of time, Aaron ponders the uh, Kevin McAllister of things, and Booby traps the front door in the hope that she can score a free kill. Meanwhile, back on the trail, Wolf sends Felix down the road a piece while he circles back to the house. He comes through the window and follows her down the basement where she set up a camera to flash on a timer. He finds himself irresistibly mesmerized and is drawn in until she hops out to mash up his brain pan with a log. She then hobbles out to the dining room and promptly gets blasted. Felix takes a quick detour to flip off the phone jammer before they pursue their prey. When they catch up with her in the kitchen, a fight ensues. Felix sticks her with all three inches, but in response, she installs a blender into his dome and purees his whole mind. She then removes her knife and brings it down sharply onto Z's fontanelle. As she takes a quick breather, Felix's phone begins to ring. She answers, and without saying a word, Crispin reveals he also had a role in this whole escapade. He's still not caught on to the fact that he's not talking to Felix. He enters the home and finds himself squared off with the sole survivor. Recognizing that she may be a little upset, he reassures her that her role was to be the independent witness, and therefore unharmed. So you see, babe, it's all good, right, babe? His apologies, offer of money, maybe an engagement? Do not settle well with her. She does what's necessary, but right in full view of the responding officer. Man, and she's gonna have a hell of a time explaining all of this. No, I'm done! Oh, right, right, right. All right, so just finalizing a few details here. Papa Paul was a very wealthy man as a result of holding a position at a company that had some sort of lucrative Department of Defense contract. Having given their children everything they've ever wanted in life, they grew up soft and spoiled. Failing to find a sufficient degree of success on their own, Felix and Crispin conspired with Felix's girlfriend Z to hire some shady types to invade the home and kill everyone therein so the brothers could split the inheritance. Crispin, Felix, Z, and Aaron were to be the only survivors. Aaron was included in the plan specifically to act as a disinterested witness who had nothing to gain. However, it's not clear why she would be primary in that regard over Z, other than that Z gave the impression of being a person of low character. She and Felix were not married, so either girl girlfriend could have actually fulfilled that role. Erin was raised on the survivalist compound by her father until she turned 15. She then went to live under more normal circumstances with her mother. When things started popping off, she automatically went back into a state of trying to manage the stress of what was happening by doing what came naturally to her, surviving. The fact that her skills were so easily transferred over to the task of killing folks was a surprise to her as well, and she seemed to require some time to process this at various points throughout the evening. It was even more of a surprise to the intruders, as Crispin had never heard these stories and had no idea of her background. Therefore, the three men, at least one of them a veteran of the military, had no idea what they were walking into. If it wasn't clear, Crispin left under the pretense of trying to get help just because he was going to survive anyway, and he had decided that he had seen enough violence. He wanted to wait it out outside because he is, after all, a pacifist. He'd been out loitering and returned after he saw that his phone had service again due to Felix turning off the blocker. There's not much to critique here. This is an excellently constructed script with everything flowing nicely and happening for fairly clear and concrete reasons. The motivations of the characters were also hinted at and then fully explored over the course of the movie. I'd say the only things that left me wondering were the thing with the call to 911 that may go through as a text if there's any reception. I kinda get that. Landlines all have at least a minimal amount of power going to them so that even if you aren't paying for service to your landline, you could plug in a phone and dial 911. That line of communication is left as open as possible. So maybe she was saying that a disrupted call to 911 converts to a text and is held in a queue to be shot out whenever the chance arises. I've never heard of that, and there's no causal indication provided for why it happened to find a moment of reception at just that time. I also can't think of a reason why Felix needed to turn off the phone jammer when he did, and some of the other actions taken in those final moments were sloppy. However, the plan had shifted several times throughout the evening, leaving them scrambling to catch up and figure out the best path towards 
of success, and they were all fairly tired and emotional. Mistakes were sure to abound and can be easily forgiven in the context of the story. The pluses for this movie are innumerable. The fact that coming up with criticisms involves some fairly extreme nitpicking should be a pretty good indication of that. As I said, the whole structure of this story and the action that unfolds was put together very well. We learn enough about each of the characters in their short time to understand who they are, what they want, and to care for them enough to make their passing impactful. A specific example of this is when Aaron complimented Crispin on the quality of his parents. Given the plan set to unfold in the near future, this also provides context to Aaron's character, who reveals her unusual upbringing later in the movie. The two characters had completely different interpretations of their circumstances based on their personal histories. There are connections like that throughout. The film also plays things fairly straight with steadily escalating anxiety as the family comes to understand the situation they're in. The way this is set up and executed really makes you feel despair. The tension continues through the remainder of the movie, but with some violence being dished out in ways that provide levity despite the brutality. This is also a film that becomes more interesting on repeat watches. I still catch new things from time to time. The actors are clearly playing their characters with the foreknowledge of what's to come. The subtlety in what's shown seems to come from their intentions being obscured through clever directing. That makes for a lot of interesting little background details to uncover. This also creates a level of rewatchability that is completely independent of the normal levels of rewatchability earned through just being an awesome movie. As I stated in the introduction, this film is a masterpiece that will easily find itself on lists of all-timers as it ages. Because of this, I would recommend the movie to anyone, horror fans in particular and especially fans of the home invasion genre, which is one of the more unsettling genres as it's grounded by realistic scenarios. This makes it easy for the viewer to imagine themselves in those scenarios. As a result, this may be a bit more intense than what a casual viewer is looking for. The intensity definitely hits a swell within the first third of the movie. However, if you make it through that, you are rewarded consistently throughout. I think the main thing that cements this in the horror genre is a large volume of blood and violence on display. They don't shy away from it at any point, and the movie is fairly vindictive in how it doles out punishment. Part of the anxiety derives from the fact that they make it clear up front that no one is safe, and everyone will be brutalized, whether they seem to deserve it or not. Outside of that, it's just an all-around good movie, excellently written with competent and reasonable survival techniques. It only strays outside of realistic depictions of violence a couple of times, but it does so in an interesting way that provides a good payoff. This movie is highly, highly recommended. And before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.